Hello, my name's Chris Shepherd. I'm one of the stud vets at BW based at the Willersley Clinic. I've been at Willersley for more years than I'd care to remember, uh, but in that time have developed a special interest in thoroughbred and uh, competition mare and stallion reproduction. I'd like to talk to you over the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes on how to choose the right stallion for your mare. We're going to talk through the following considerations, starting with looking at the pedigree, then considering the genetics and genetic uh, effects on the progeny. Uh, we'll, we'll talk through the various health tests that the stallion that you're going to use needs to be tested for. Uh, and then we will uh, discuss what sort of fertility parameters you should ask for uh, when you're researching a stallion. We'll have a quick look at sex semen, which for competition horse breeding is now an option for some stallions. We'll look at the various stud books only briefly, but a very uh, brief description of the most commonly used stud books. And then finally, just want to run through uh, understanding the costs and terms of the stud fee, because they can vary from stallion to stallion. So the starting point for any search for a stallion is really looking at the pedigree uh, of the stallion. And ideally, you need to have at least a three generation pedigree. Uh, basic principles of the pedigree are that the stallion will always be uh, listed on the top line and the, the mare on the bottom line. Um, there may or may not be some uh, basic information for, for each horse that's within the pedigree, such as year of birth, colour, etc. But yeah, we're going to look at the uh, performance of the, the stallion, the performance of the ancestors of the stallion. And then I want to just talk a little bit about uh, outbreeding or crossbreeding versus uh, inbreeding or line breeding. So the first thing is to look at the performance of the stallion that, the, that, that you're thinking of using. Um, and the starting point is going to be uh, assessing competition record of that stallion. So uh, if it's a thoroughbred stallion, then um, judged by largely by prize money. Uh, if it's a competition stallion, then going to be judged by points accumulated during the career. Uh, we can also look at the competition record of, the, of any progeny to date of the stallion in a similar way. Um, so how many winners, uh, how much prize money have the progeny won? Uh, sources of that information are uh, readily available online. So if it's a thoroughbred, look, looking, looking at weather biz information online will give you uh, prize money won for stallions and for progeny of the stallions. And if it's a competition uh, stallion you're interested in, then British Venting, BSJA and British Dressage run stallion rankings and they are a useful source of reference. And then finally, WSFH uh, is, a, is another useful, very useful source of information for sports horses uh, and, and it will cover eventing, uh, dressage 
and jumping stallions and we'll give data and rankings for all of them. You can also look at the sales value of, of any progeny to date, probably most relevant for, for thoroughbreds uh, and an important uh, parameter for, for thoroughbred stallions. Pretty obvious, but, but ideally you're going to choose the, the, the best stallion that you can afford uh, and the price of a stallion is going to be determined by the performance of the stallion and performance of progeny that we've just discussed. So then we look at the performance of the ancestors further down the pedigree um, and assess them really in a similar way to the stallion's own performance. It's always a good idea to choose a stallion that is a good match for the dam's sire, the so-called dam sire, and, and that's considered really important. You only really need to look at first, second and third generation uh, of the pedigree because anything beyond that is probably so far away that it's not going to have much influence on the, the, the stallion that, that you're considering. But in choosing the stallion, uh, also really useful to try and correct any confirmation defects that your mare might have. Um, and not only consider defects of your mare, but also uh, if, if, if you can uh, consider defects in her mother and in any half sisters that you might choose to or might be able to correct by choosing the appropriate stallion. So just want to have, talk a bit quickly about uh, the difference between crossbreeding and line breeding. Crossbreeding is really common in, uh, in sports horse breeding. Uh, so warm bloods being cross with thoroughbreds, et cetera, et cetera. And basically uh, what, you're, what you're doing is using two different breeds with the aim of uh, reproducing the desirable traits of, of both parents. Uh, the alternative is line breeding or inbreeding, which is used uh, occasionally. Um, and, and the intention there is to do duplicate um, desirable traits from certain ancestors, from the same ancestors. If you're doing it, you, you really, you shouldn't, they should be no closer than three generations. Um, and uh, in thoroughbred breeding, some, sometimes it is difficult to avoid some degree of line breeding because um, of a more limited pool of, of stallions. The, the same stallions will crop up within the same pedigrees. The downside of li line breeding is, is potentially um, homozygosity, which can increase the chance of chance of offspring being affected by deleterious recessive traits. I'd now like to consider uh, a few characteristics that are genetically determined and you should look at in your choice of stallion. So we'll just run through what's listed here. Uh, so confirmation, hereditary diseases, temperament, probably won't uh, talk about temperament in, in any detail, but bear in mind um, there will be a hereditary component to it. So it's something that you want to assess in the stallion that you um, are thinking about using. Uh, we'll look at size and briefly coat colour. So confirmation is obviously genetically determined and is uh, a hereditary characteristic. It's uh, 
a potentially a, a huge subject in its own. Um, but there's various bits of confirmation that you want to look for in the stallion. Uh, limb confirmation probably being the most uh, uh, one that's talked about. Um, but also back confirmation, foot confirmation, really important and very variable between breeds. Um, some are notoriously poor for foot con confirmation and others uh, much better. Uh, also neck confirmation, uh, chest confirmation and uh, the amount of bone uh, which is the uh, circumference of the cannon bone uh, is uh, uh, again quite frequently talked about and referred to uh, and uh, it, it may be something that you want to match up with the mare that you have in mind. But, but certainly possible to balance any deficiencies uh, in the, that you may have uh, in your mare by, uh, uh, at, the, at the very least, not choosing a stallion that may have a similar de deficiency. But, but most stallions that you, you, you will uh, look at, if they've got as far as being approved and graded in a stud book, will have good confirmation. There are various hereditary diseases that are genetically uh, determined. Uh, polysaccharide storage myopathy is uh, a, bit, it's a bit like tying up and a disease that we see quite frequently, uh, PSSM it's referred to, uh, genetically linked to uh, some quarter horses, draft breeds, uh, but also in some warm bloods. There's a condition in Arabs called severe combined immunodeficiency, which is uh, definitely to be avoided. Um, melanomas uh, are obviously very common in grey horses, so by definition, uh, will have some sort of uh, genetic or hereditary uh, possibilities. Warm blood fragile foal syndrome is quite topical uh, at the moment and uh, both mares and uh, stallions can be tested uh, using a, a hair sample to see if they carry those genes and uh, Certainly, if, if uh, both stallion and mare are carrying the, the, the affected genes, then they shouldn't be used together. Um, and, and then some uh, conditions or diseases that are not, not entirely genetically determined, but, but related to confirmation, um, you also need to bear in mind. So things such as uh, roarers uh, in horses or what, what we call laryngeal hemiplegia. Uh, it, it's uh, a condition which is, is, is going to be more common in, in big horses with long necks um, and uh, obviously certain soundness uh, issues are going to be more of a problem in um, horses with uh, suboptimal conformation. Um, the size of the stallion is, is often talked about, but ultimately it's the size of the mare's uterus that will govern the size of, of, of the foal. Um, so uh, Twink Allen many years ago using AI proved that uh, you can use, use a Shire stallion on a pony mare and the foal uh, that the pony mare produces won't be too big uh, and vice versa you can use a pony stallion on a Shire mare 
and you won't get a little vole. It will be it'll be appropriate for the size of the the shire mare. Um, so it, it with 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 AI, it gives you great scope for using any any stallion that you want to use on your mare. Obviously, in a natural cover situation, um, then there are limitations. Uh, just as a bit of a by the way, um, the, the fetal oversize is because of what we've just discussed is is uh, is is uncommon, and, and any any problems at foaling are more likely because the mare is overweight. Um, but rather than um, fetal oversize. Um, coat colour, so there's basically uh, three base, base colours, chestnut, bay and black. And uh, there are various DNA tests um, that you can use on, on mares and stallions to Determine the likelihood of offspring having a, a given colour. Um, you hear, you'll hear about some stallions being homozygous, um, particularly skewball uh, coloured skewball stallions. Some are uh, homozygous, and if they have two dominant alleles, then they're um, they're going to pass on their their coat colour. Um, as, a, as opposed to heterozygous uh, skewball stallions. There are colour calculators available online which you can play around with and might find useful to uh, give you some sort of guidance as to uh, coat, coat colour you're going to achieve. So next I want to just talk through the various health tests that a stallion needs to have had taken uh, before he's suitable for covering or providing semen for insemination. Um, and it's, it's, it's important for, for you to confirm that the stallion has been tested uh, for these diseases. Um, all venereal diseases can be transmitted in semen so uh, certainly using AI uh, doesn't eliminate the risk of, of uh, venereal diseases being transmitted to your mare and also important to realize that uh, venereal diseases can survive uh, the chilling and freezing process so uh, frozen semen is uh, susceptible to uh, venereal diseases. Um, if you want to learn more about um, health testing and, and venereal disease checking, uh, there's a really good uh, protocol described in the HBLB guide on the control of venereal diseases, which is available online uh, for, for you to have a look at and understand. Um, Really important if you are using AI that uh, when semen is delivered uh, for your mare, it has the right and appropriate documentation. And part of that documentation will list uh, and confirm that the stallion has been tested uh, and is disease free. Um, likewise, uh, certainly in a natural cover situation uh, your mare will have to be tested for uh, same venereal diseases uh, to make sure that she's not spreading anything to the stallion and uh, also if, if uh, she's being inseminated and she goes to uh, an insemina insemination clinic or centre then uh, she may well have to have uh, disease screening before she goes to that centre. So the bacterial venereal diseases that we're concerned about are contagious equine metritis or CEM. Uh, luckily now very rare, uh, certainly in, in thoroughbred population.
population, but does crop up occasionally in warm bloods uh, and, and pony breeds. Um, other two uh, bacterial infections, Pseudomonas and Klebsiella, uh, again, do crop up occasionally uh, and are transmissible in, in semen and by natural cover. So every stallion uh, will have to be, at the beginning of each breeding season, will have to have two samples uh, taken at least a week apart and only when the results are clear and available can the stallion be used. Stallion also needs to be tested for equine viral arteritis and just need one negative blood sample taken at the beginning of each breeding season uh, before the stallion is used. But some stallions will be EVA positive if they've been vaccinated or possibly have previously been infected. EVA is a, a disease reasonably common in Europe, so imported stallions may have been exposed uh, and previously infected. If uh, a stallion is EVA positive because of vaccination, he should have had a blood sample taken before the vaccinations were started to confirm that he was negative before being vaccinated. And also all the vaccinations should be entered into his passport to make sure that he's had them at the right times. Uh, if a stallion is EVA positive and hasn't been vaccinated, uh, or if the vaccinations have lapsed, then the stallion will have to have a, uh, a, a, an EVA virus PCR test done on a semen sample uh, taken at the beginning of the breed, breeding season uh, to make sure that he's not actually shedding EVA in, in his semen. Equine infectious anemia is basically a disease spread by biting flies, uh, not something we uh, see in, in, in the UK, but potentially uh, can be spread by uh, spread in semen, which is why it's relevant, obviously, uh, in this discussion, uh, as a by the way, it can also be spread by administration of blood products uh, uh, and plasma. Um, it's, it causes a high fever uh, and, and depression and uh, uh, internal bleeding. Again, one negative blood sample to be, to be taken at the beginning of the breeding season to rule out um, that the um, stallion isn't carrying equine infectious anemia. The next section is, is to discuss the options of using natural cover or artificial insemination and then breaking AI down into fresh semen, chilled semen and frozen semen. In a thoroughbred situation then obviously if the foal is to be registered with, with Weatherbiz then at the moment, uh, there is no choice other than natural cover. Um, so just want to talk uh, about um, the natural cover situation and uh, characteristics of, a, uh, of, of, of sperm numbers. So the average ejaculate from a warm blood or thoroughbred stallion Will probably contain about five billion sperm. Um, that's far more than are actually needed to uh, achieve conception and uh, it's generally accepted that uh, only uh, 0.3 billion or 300 million sperm are, are needed for conception. Um, so um, the, there is a huge excess which uh, means that most stallions or busy thoroughbred stallions can, can do multiple coverings in a day. 
and even though the sperm numbers will decline a bit with with uh, subsequent coverings, there's there's still sufficient to achieve conception. Uh, and also, as as stallions get older, the, the there may be some reduction in fertility, but because there is such a huge excess in in younger uh, stallions, um, then even there is if there is a slight decline, then um, ex uh, fertility may still be uh, acceptable. We no normally uh, think that uh, conception rate or first cycle conception rate, the chances of a mare getting pregnant um, when if they're covered naturally, if, if everything is favourable, then first cycle conception rate for, for natural cover will be about 75%. Um, and we call this a, a, a breeding prognosis. Um, and um, there are variables in uh, mare fertility, largely governed by age, but also uh, governed by other uh, uh, abnormalities that mare, mares can have. But if they are considered of optimal fertility and the stallion is optimal fertility, then there's an approximately 75% chance of the mare getting pregnant uh, when she's covered. So in choosing a stallion, you, you want to get as much information as you can on his uh, previous conception rates. Uh, and uh, it, with thoroughbred stallions, uh, because uh, um, records are, uh, uh, are well documented and kept, then it's usually possible to get uh, conception rate information. In other situations, uh, in, with other stallions, it may not be so easy. With artificial insemination, we've, we've got three options. First one being uh, using fresh semen. Um, and fresh semen means that the, the, the semen should be inseminated into the mare within uh, about two hours uh, from being collected from the stallion. So it allows you basically to choose a stallion within one to two hours travel time from, from where your mare is or where she's going to be inseminated. So the seam is collected, um, it's extended uh, and, and then usually kept at room temperature or, or 20 degrees C uh, during transport uh, and then inseminated into the mare. So uh, in, in, in storing it for a short time and not cooling it or chilling it, it its viability is well maintained and uh, optimal first cycle conception rates with fresh semen are going to be about 80% again, assuming that um, their fertility is, is optimal. Um, so the, the, good, the, 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 the good thing with fresh semen AI is the uh, viability of, of the semen. Um, the, the downside is geographically you, you may be limited to local stallions, but um, if um, if you've got an old, older mare that's not suitable for chilled or frozen semen, then uh, fresh semen may be the best option. Uh, again, if possible, you want to establish the stallion's conception rates in, in previous years uh, using fresh semen, if you can get hold of that information. Uh, chilled semen um, can be stored for, for 24 hours between collection and being inseminated in, into the mare. So that gives you geographically a much wider area for uh, choosing your stallions. So uh, certainly possible to use stallions anywhere uh, within the UK uh, and also uh, stallions in Europe because semen can be collected, 
delivered overnight by courier and inseminated into your mare the next day. Um, optimal first cycle conception rates about 70%, uh, so not quite as good as fresh semen because the, the semen has been in this situation chilled, uh, so there is some slight damage to it, um, but um, perfectly acceptable conception rates if, uh, if uh, mare fertility is, is good. Again, uh, try and establish um, conception rates that the, the stallion you want to use has had with chilled semen in, in previous years because some they are variable and some stallion semen is suitable for chilling most stallion semen is suitable for chilling but there are some that don't to tolerate chilling particularly well downsides of using chilled semen uh, you are reliant on on couriers for delivery uh, and uh, that's not always going to work uh, depend, dependent on international couriers uh, for chilled semen from Europe and um, there can be delivery issues. Um, also really important that as we said before that the correct paperwork arrives with with chilled semen and, and because it has to be collected and delivered fairly quickly then sometimes there can be delays in, in getting the paperwork um, but it can't be inseminated unless the paperwork is available. Uh, third option with AI is frozen semen and uh, frozen semen allows access to uh, a, a lot of foreign stallions, some of which aren't, aren't available through chilled semen, but also um, because frozen semen can be stored for uh, indefinitely, years and years, it, it, uh, it does allow access to deceased stallions that have had semen frozen um, before they died, uh, and, and also some castrated stallions where semen has been extracted and, and frozen before castration. The uh, good thing about frozen semen is that it can be delivered uh, because it, it'll, it can stay frozen, as we've said, for, for, long, for a long time. It can be delivered well in advance of the, of the um, uh, time of the mare needing inseminating. Uh, days, weeks ahead if necessary. So it does give ample time for correct paperwork to, to be uh, located and supplied. Um, because it's been frozen, there has been some, uh, a bit more damage to, to the semen uh, and therefore first cycle conception rates um, are a bit reduced. Um, but uh, if everything's uh, optimal uh, if it's if it's good quality frozen semen and uh, good mare fertility then you can achieve can expect 60% uh, first cycle conception rates with with frozen semen again uh, some stallion semen freezes better than others so um, ha having access to information on conception rates from previous years um, is is really useful and also uh, you, you you need to know the number of progressively motile sperm PMS in the dose of sperm that you are buying or uh, is being inseminated because it is hugely variable and ideally we will always inseminate 300 million progressively motile sperm um, but in some situations um, we are asked to or forced to inseminate much lower doses and that can work okay but you need to be aware that conception rates might be um, not, not so good if you're using uh, lower sperm numbers.
frozen semen, as I say, can work perfectly well, um, but it's probably favourable for mares with good fertility histories, um, as opposed to uh, poor breeders, uh, which may not be suitable for, for, for frozen semen, which will have some reduction in its viability and lifespan. So it is now possible to get sexed semen from some competition stallions. It has become possible to separate uh, X and Y spermatozoa because they have differing amounts of DNA using a flow cytometer. The process is about 95% reliable. So it means that you can select uh, purchase semen of either Y, X and Y or XX bearing chromosomes and choose within 95% uh, reliability the sex of the foal that you want to have. The, 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 the sorting process is quite slow uh, and takes... Uh, several hours through a flow cytometer. So the, the dose you buy will be reduced sperm numbers um, and, and therefore conception rates might be slightly lower than with a normal insemination. Bear in mind that most stallions that are offering sex semen will charge a premium for it because of the time that goes into preparing the, uh, the, the sample. Uh, and the cost of insemination might be a bit higher because the vet that's doing the inseminating will have to inseminate very close to the time of, of ovulation. So I just want to talk a little bit about the cost and terms of the stud fee. And there are various uh, options available with different stallions. And the, the main message is to speak to the stallion owner or the semen supplier to make sure you fully understand what the terms of the stud fee are and what the implications are if the mare doesn't get pregnant. I've list listed a few uh, possibilities here which we can run through. So we have no foal, no fee, uh, and that might mean either the mare doesn't get pregnant or uh, if she does get pregnant, but unfortunately the foal doesn't survive within five days after it's born, uh, then the, the fee is refundable. There may be a time limit for the uh, mare that just doesn't get pregnant, uh, and, and usually it's the 1st of October, so uh, you do need to have the mare checked by the 1st of October to know whether she is still pregnant or not. No foal free return is another common one uh, and, and basically means that uh, you can keep covering the mare or inseminating the mare on subsequent cycles until she gets pregnant. If she hasn't got pregnant by the end of the breeding season, then you can in most cases carry on uh, the, the following year uh, and uh, you don't pay a, another stud fee although it is, as I say, variable and uh, check with the, the semen supplier or the stallion owner because sometimes if you go into a subsequent year, you do have to pay part of the stud fee again. Um, and depending on the stud, again, you, you may be able to you swap the domination to a different stallion either during the same season or, 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 or next the following year, and may even be able to swap the mare if the mare's proving difficult to get pregnant. Uh, live foal guarantee, it's a little bit the same as no foal, no fee. Um, and then 1st of October terms, um, similar that uh, the mare needs to be checked by 1st of October to make sure she's still in foal. I want to talk about the implications of paying uh, for frozen semen. Um, 
with fresh and chilled semen, the, the terms are near, nearly always no fold free return. So the stallion stud will keep supplying fresh or chilled semen uh, until you get the mare pregnant. Uh, the, the, uh, there will be a collection fee that you have to pay each time, but you don't pay a, a repeat of the stud fee. It is no fold free return. Uh, with frozen semen, things can be slightly different, and and, and ver again, various ways that the, the stud feed can be payable. It may be that you pay the, the normal stud fee the, for the stallion were he providing chilled semen or fresh semen, uh, and for that fee, you get a specified number of insemination doses, and it's usually two or three. Uh, and if the mare gets pregnant with the first dose, then the second and the third dose remain the property of the stallion owner. And if the mare hasn't got pregnant after the third dose, then there's no refund of the stud fee. And uh, that's bad luck for the, the mare owner. Uh, the other option with frozen semen is, is to pay per dose. So you just buy one, you can if you want, just buy one dose uh, and it's it's uh, up to you whether you split that dose or use a full dose. And the pricing in that situation is usually one third of the normal stud fee. You need to know what you're buying, as we've said previously, uh, and uh, either you or your vet needs to ideally ascertain the number of progressively motile sperm in the dose that's being supplied. And most reputable uh, um, suppliers will be able to provide this information. Ideally, we're inseminating 300 million progressively motile sperm each time we do an insemination. But uh, it is possible to uh, get pregnancies with reduced sperm numbers uh, and, and certainly uh, sometimes we're splitting doses either at the mare owner's request because they want to try and get more pregnancies out of one dose than they've ordered but uh, need to have a discussion on conception rates with, mare, with the mare owner just so that they understand the implications of using a split dose. Just talking about uh, the various stud books that are available, uh, obviously with, with in the thoroughbred world there is only one, but in, in sports horse breeding there are lots of different stud books, uh, a few in the UK uh, and lots of different ones in, in Europe. Uh, mo most of these Sports horse stud books use different classification systems for how they how they list their stallions. So again, just need to make sure you understand which category the stallion that you're interested in sits within. Um, as an example, with the Anglo-European stud book, they they have four different categories. So. The, the, the lower end of the scale are registered stallions. Uh, so these are often younger stallions, maybe uh, somewhat unproven. Uh, next scale up are licensed stallions. So again, um, may not be competing yet, but will have done a bit more. And then there's the uh, approved stallions, which have are or have been competing. And the classification is based largely on the performance of them or the performance of their offspring. And then the very highest level within the Anglo-European stud book are elite stallions, which are graded uh, on the and based on, on performance at the very highest level. Uh, obviously, performance isn't the only criteria for stallions to be accepted within a stud book and, and, and the stud books will assess them on uh, confirmation and uh, um, other parameters as, as, well, as well as their performance. So that's it for me. 
I, I hope that's been a useful guide and, and will give you some help as how you should select a stallion for your mare. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the course.